So of course, I mean, of course, we would like to, we need to involve our patients in the treatment decision. We need to offer them the options, our recommended strategies perhaps, but take into account a phrase that Les is fond of saying, their values and preferences. So we're always doing a risk benefit analysis, right? And as we've showed you, there are differences in the risk particularly for certain kinds of risks. So you're always taking that into account and you want to know certain specific things. What exact condition are we treating? Turns out that, for instance, patients with schizophrenia tend to be a little more tolerant of certain side effects than mood disorder patients. So that may come into this. Uh, what specific symptoms am I trying to treat? As I mentioned earlier, some of the drugs may be more calming, some more activating. We want to know their history of the medications and how it went. We want to know comorbidity, we want to know their metabolic risk. Uh, concomitant medications is a big one. There are drug-drug interactions we didn't talk about. Some, they're metabolized differently and so some drug-drug interactions are more relevant than others. And then the shared decision-making, of course, patient-centered approach to making decisions. Instead of us being paternalistic and dictating to the patient, we need to involve them. And uh, we, there's a lot of research that outcomes are better, adherence is better when the patient is involved in the decision-making process. So this is evidence-based practice. <clears throat> it means taking into account your clinical judgment, the relevant scientific evidence out there, and your patient's values and preferences. It's not a cookbook, and it requires us to know as much as we can about the old and the new, and know all we can find out from our patients. Switches offer both opportunity and risk. So you may actually have a patient who responds more poorly with what you switch to. That's always going to be a risk. But keep in mind, a medicine doesn't have to be absolutely perfect. It has to relieve symptoms well enough, tolerated well enough, and that the patient has to be willing to take it. I also need to address any unrealistic expectations the patient will have. And the way to do this is with shared decision making and motivational interviewing. If I just write a prescription and say, here, go fill it, uh, it's not going to go very far. I need to identify what they want to work on, what symptoms they are concerned about. It may not be the same symptoms I'm concerned about. That's right. They may have different ideas there. And I have to figure out from the array of choices I offer them, you know, I need to be mindful about what I'm offering. And then once they pick something or collaboratively agree to take something, then I'm ahead of the game yeah. because they'll be more inclined to go along with the plan yeah. if they have actively participated in it. I certainly find uh, not only are symptoms important, which symptoms matter to the patient, but often aspects of quality of life and function are very important to a patient. So understanding their particular hobbies, interests, uh, what their roles are, that can also be very helpful in monitoring treatment. You know, I always ask my patients if they watch television and most of them do, and I ask them what's their favorite program. And then I get a, you know, a sense of where they're at. Because if it's uh, nature shows, soap operas, game shows, it tells me a bit about them. And it also makes them feel that I'm, I'm interested. Now, I may or may not be interested, but at least I fake it, right? <laughs> no, I am. And that goes a long way. Yes, that's true. It demonstrates caring. So what other things about shared switch decisions should we consider? I mean, a big aspect, especially for the illnesses that we're likely to use in atypical antipsychotic for is insight and judgment. Remember that serious mental illnesses affect parts of the brain that have to do with self-observation, insight and judgment. So you want to take that into account, of course. You want to understand what's motivating the switch. Is it something I read in some deep, dark corner of the internet? Is it a family member said, oh my God, risperidone will you know, make you blind or something like that? Um, you want to uh, understand other people in, the life, in their life who are influential. That's actually helpful. Past experiences and goals and values is so important. And I, I, like, I like the TV show, but I ask about hobbies and interests and, you know, what's your typical day like? What matters to you? What's important to you? Those kinds of things are so important. It, an interesting question we don't always ask is, are there certain side effects that bother you more than others? And I've been surprised. Sometimes a patient, oh my God, whatever you do, don't make me nauseous. I just hate nausea. Well, that's going to influence my decision, of course. Some people say, you know, I need help getting to sleep at night or I hate sedation. Well, that's going to influence my choice. As we mentioned, that's different. Um, you want to talk about th uh, sexual side effects is another and very important one, of course, and they vary for that. Um, convenience. I, I, I've never forget one of the first patients that I 
was uh, trying to talk to about an LAI. I said, wait a minute, I don't have to take a pill every day? I said, yeah, why? He said, taking a pill every day is a daily reminder I'm crazy. And also, he was very excited about the convenience of it. I just don't have to worry about this. So there, there are issues like that. Uh, clozapine, of course, music to our friend Jonathan Meyer's ears. Um, a patient should probably not be considered treatment resistant until they have had an LAI, by the way, because adherence is such a challenge. Even for, for me, and I don't have schizophrenia, although I do have certain aspects of cognitive impairment, which we can talk about later. 